Old Testament reading is Isaiah chapter 58, beginning with the third verse. Why have we fasted and you do not see it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Is this not the fast that I choose, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share the, your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you take away from the midst of you the yoke, the pointing of the finger, and speaking wickedness, if you pour out yourself for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then, sh then shall your light rise in the darkness, and your gloom be as the noonday. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire with good things and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters fail not. And your, and your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The gospel reading is Matthew chapter five, beginning with the 13th verse. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trodden underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid nor do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. Let your light show shine before men, that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Last Tuesday morning, I had the privilege of finding myself in the city of Jerusalem. Uh, our bishop and I took 30-something uh, young clergy to show them the Holy Land, including uh, our own Aaron Bell, Tiffany Thomas from South Tryon Community Church. It was a great trip. On Tuesday morning, I showed them a stone step. It's about as wide as these bell tables and about as long as from here to the wall. It is the one step that remains from the temple that Isaiah would have stood in. It would have been part of the staircase that he walked up to preach this sermon that Dale has just read to us. I wish I could have been there to hear Isaiah's words, although I think all of us can understand the mood of the people who gathered to hear Isaiah that day. Their mood was one of immense disappointment, and we know disappointment. I mean, back then, uh, the economy was disappointing. They'd had high hopes, but everything had just fallen apart. Government was disappointing. I suspect religious life was disappointing. And that probably bled into their family lives and into their individual lives. It's always that way, isn't it? Like, could you look at yourself and you think, I feel a little blue. And you wonder what's wrong with you, but it's never just you. We live in a society that's kind of blue. We live in a culture that's kind of depressed. We live in a society that's pretty anxious, and it just bleeds into all of us. I read a blog the other day by a person talking about his addictions. He wrote, drugs and alcohol are not my problem. Reality is my problem. Drugs and alcohol are my attempted solution. Reality is a problem. There's a disappointment at the heart of things. And let me just say that it is inevitable God actually wired the world to be this way so that this world would never be enough, so they'd always yearn for something beyond this world, which is what God promises us, which is what God draws us toward. 
Isaiah notices that the people say, Lord, we have fasted, but you did not notice. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Is if you do something religious, like God should be a little bit impressed. God should respond, since I did something religious. I said a prayer. I went to church. I gave some money. I served. God should respond, how long, O Lord, before you respond to what I have done? These people have even fasted. You and I don't know much about fasting. We know all about satisfying our desires. I think of somebody like my, my wife's grandfather. This is interesting. He was a Baptist minister up in Winston-Salem, and the family stories uh, say that, for instance, when they would have a financial crisis in the church or if they had a big decision that they needed to make, that Dr. Charles Stevens, the pastor, and the leaders of the church, they'd fast. They wouldn't eat for 24 hours, would stay up all night praying. You and, I have, you and I have these pale imitations of a fast. You know, at Lent, you know, I give up something really profound like chocolate. It's hard giving up chocolate. Like, you have to resort to donuts or something to satisfy the <laughs> sweet. It's hard. And uh, fast, the people say that, that we, have, we have fasted, and, and how do you say it? God's not impressed by their fast, but it's because they're, they're really fasting just for their own selves. Uh, there is an importance to fasting, uh, by the way. We're doing this emotionally healthy spirituality. One of the things that Peter Scazzaro is trying to teach us in this series is that we need to do some fasting from, how should we say it, like all our gadgets that are on all the time. We need to fast from our busyness. We need to learn how to stop. We need to learn how to take a deep breath. We need to learn how to say no. We need to fast from something so they might be able to connect with God. You know, there's this sneaky peril in this Emotionally Healthy Spirituality series that we're doing. I like it. It's wonderful. People are responding to it. It's a cool thing that we're doing. I'm really glad we're doing it. The sneaky peril in it, though, is, right, is that it's, it's kind of about me, isn't it? Like, it, it's, it's how am I doing with God? Am I growing with God? Am I closer to God? What, what's my anxiety level? What? And, and that's a good thing to think about. But then we get all turned in on ourselves, which is actually emotionally unhealthy to do because God wired us in a way that if we get turned in on ourselves, we're actually frustrated. God wired us so that we would come out of ourselves. Uh, God is a sneaky one, isn't he? Uh, God says that it's only when you deny yourself that you find yourself. It's only when you deny yourself some pleasures that you discover true pleasure, sneaky of God to do that kind of thing. You only discover your own fulfillment when you actually give yourself away for others. That's why we nag you about things like sponsoring a child in Haiti or going to Costa Rica or all the stuff that we nag you about all the time. I know something that happened in Israel that was absolutely amazing to me. Uh, we, uh, we landed in Tel Aviv, and then we drove to Jerusalem. And the second night that we were there, there was a missionary there. Uh, from, he's from North Carolina. And after dinner, he asked if some of us wanted to go see uh, the refugee camp there in Bethlehem. We're in Bethlehem, right? It's Christmas all year in Bethlehem. But there's a refugee camp there. I, mean, I don't know how you feel about things politically in the Middle East, if you're you know, pro-Zionist or pro-Palestinian. But the fact of the matter is, since 1948, there are a lot of Palestinians that have been uprooted for their homes. It still goes on. You hear about the settlements being built. There are people that lose their homes. They don't have anywhere to go. So they go to these refugee camps. And this missionary took us on a tour of the refugee camp in Bethlehem. Huge, packed, and you and I would call it squalor. So we toured the camp, and then we went to visit somebody who lives right across the street from the refugee camp. This is interesting. Uh, we visited this couple. They didn't know we were coming. We just knocked on the door. Suddenly, they have company of 15 people. Come in. And we came in, and we met this couple and their children. Uh, their names are Ziggy and Jamil. Uh, Jamil's story is really fascinating. He grew up in a devout Muslim family. But uh, when he was an adult, he kept having this dream that said, listen to Jesus, listen to Jesus. So he went to a priest, and he said, I don't know what this dream means, listen to Jesus. And the priest explained to him what Jesus was about, and he converted and became a Christian. And that's really hard if you live in Palestine these days, and he had to endure the hostility of his family and some violence even. But he became a Christian, and he married this woman, Ziggy, and they had their family. They had to decide where to live, and they chose to live. Listen to this. They chose to live directly across the street from Bethlehem's refugee camp. 
And they hold down jobs during the day, and then what they do at night with their spare time is they go into the refugee camp and they do whatever they can to help people there. They may paint a wall, they may repair a toilet, they may take somebody to the doctor or whatever. That's just what they do with their time. I was stunned by this. And I asked Jamil, I said, why, why do you do this? And he looked at me and he said, isn't that just what Christians do? I said, well, yeah, I mean, at Myers Park, all our people do that. They, <laughs> they choose to live in the poorest part of town, and they take their spare time not to indulge themselves. They, they go to serve. Of course, that's what they do. What's interesting about this house that we went to is, is how, do I, how do I say it? The joy in their household was just unmistakable. There was just this immense joy there. I thought about that. Like, you and I miss out on the joy, and you know why we miss out on the joy? Isaiah uh, refers to it. <laughs> it says that God is not fond of the pointing of the finger. And you and I are masters, aren't we, of the pointing of the finger. We see someone who is poor, and we say, it must be their fault that they're poor. Or we say, they should take responsibility for their own lives. Or we point at some program for the poor, and they say, that program should probably not really effective. And we point the finger, and we point the finger, and we miss out on the joy. Sometimes what we do, uh, this is my favorite one, by the way, is uh, we indulge in what I now call the Stephen Furtick Gambit. The Stephen Furtick Gambit. Stephen Furtick, you may know, is the pastor of our neighboring church here in Charlotte, Elevation Church. And he got in considerable trouble recently, right? Because it was announced that he bought a 16,000 square foot house. And oh my goodness, the smug sanctimony of Christians, including me, all over Charlotte. How dare a man of God buy a 16,000 square foot house? Oh, he says he's a Christian, but he should. Oh, oh, oh. We do that, right? And then the members of Elevation Church respond by saying, Look at all we have done for the needy. In the past 10 years, we've given a million dollars. And in the paper the other day, so they gave $300,000 for the poor. This led me, James Howell, I just have to confess my sin to you. I did the devil's math. And the devil's math is like this. You gave a million dollars in 10 years. You're 10 times as big as we are. We gave way more than a million dollars in the past 10 years. <laughs> And then it was in the paper the other day, $300,000. I thought, we topped that easy last year. This is the Stephen Furtick gambit. It's the devil's math. It's when we sit around and say, look at what we've done. Look at what we've done. I'll have my 16,000 square foot house or whatever. How should we say it? God says that we're to give our lives for people who are in need. God actually asks us to be like Ziggy and Jamil. Jamil's name in Arabic means beautiful. He is a beautiful person. It's part of the genius of the emotionally healthy spirituality, right, is that we're all poor, broken, and impoverished, and that's good cause to join hands with those who are poor, broken, and impoverished. Isaiah 58 makes it very clear. The fast that God desires is to set the oppressed free, to share your bread, to share your bread, to bring the homeless into your house to cover the naked. Then your light shall break forth. The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. It's really the most selfish thing that we can do, right? It's to give of ourselves sacrificially for God's children. But it's not just for ourselves at the end of the day. It really is for God. If we want to be close to God, then what did God do? We sang it in the opening hymn, His robe is the light. I mean, I love that. Jesus' robe was the light, but he dirtied that robe. He got down on the ground with the poorest of the poor. He didn't point the finger at them and blame them or suggest that it, it, he just loved them. He cared them. He fed the hungry. He touched the people that nobody else would touch. He took up residence right next to the poorest of the poor. That's part of an emotionally healthy spirituality, isn't it? We all need to be part of an organization that's bigger than ourselves. We all, all need to be part of a movement that's bigger than just me. We need to be part of a church that matters. Here's the last image, and I'll be done after I talk about this. Isaiah says that in the fast that God desires, the ancient ruins will be rebuilt, the foundations will be repaired, 
then you will be known as a repairer of the breach, as a restorer of the city. A repairer of the breach, a restorer of the city. I've been thinking a lot lately about obituaries. I wonder what my obituary will say. I hope it's not written anytime soon. Be very clear. But when it's written, what will it say? When your obituary is written, I mean, what will it say? Like, you know, like, hey, great guy, had great jobs. That's not like a great obituary, isn't it? Except I kind of hope for the obituary that says, he was a repairer of the breach. He was a restorer of the city. One of the women who uh, went with me on the trip, Tiffany Thomas, she's the pastor of our sister congregation, South Tryon Community Church. You may have seen this in the paper right before we left town. She had an amazing thing that happened. She had a homeless guy who used to hang around her church. His name was James King. He preferred to be called King James. <laughs> Those of us with the name James don't mind being called that, King James. He was King James, and he could quote the King James Bible, and he would hang around the, he would hang around the church, and he was always blessing Tiffany and giving her little words of kindness and blessing. But he didn't have anywhere to live, and it was really cold, if you recall, two weeks ago, and one night he laid down on a bench, and it was too cold, and he died. And Tiffany learned about this and called me very upset from the police station. She, she'd gone to the police, and they said, quote, deaths of this sort, sort rarely make the news. Tiffany was upset, and I said, write something for the paper. I'm sure they'll print it. She did. She wrote, and you may have read it. She said, this is, this is unbearable. That in a place like Charlotte, we have all these church buildings, and there are people sleeping outside, and they're freezing to death. Like, can't we open our church doors and let somebody just sleep inside? She got dinged for this. People said, oh, no, you don't understand. That's not safe. You have insurance issues. A lot do you have to consider. And then we already have programs that take care of this. She just, she just got this just onslaught back in her face. <laughs> I said, Tiffany, you just hang in there. As he, we'll write Tiffany's obituary one day. Yeah, and it won't say, hey, she was great. She was a cool person. She had a lot of fun. No, what it'll say is she grieved heavily over a homeless person who froze to death, and she said, we're going to open our doors so somebody can come in out of cold. It's in the King James Bible, <clears throat> Matthew chapter 25. Jesus said, inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. What we do with the poor is what we do with Jesus, an emotionally healthy spirituality. Just can't. Yeah, it's Black History Month, and um, I love a lot of things out of the history of the Civil Rights Movement. One of my favorites is the city of Montgomery, Alabama. After Rosa Parks refused to get off the bus, all, all the African Americans in Montgomery wouldn't get on the bus. They fasted from the comfort of the bus, and they walked, and it was hard to walk, and there was this one old woman, especially she was in her late 80s, her name was a Mother Pollard, and she had arthritis, it was very hard for her to walk, but she just refused to rise. People would pull over and try to pick her up. One day, somebody tried to pick her up, she said, my, my feet is tired, but my soul is rested. They interviewed her and asked her why she was doing this. She said, I'm not doing this for myself, so I'm doing this for others. I'm doing this for a future generation. The question we have to ask is, what are you doing for others? What are you doing for a future generation? There's so much disappointment, and the, the black preachers in the civil rights movement, they love to quote the Psalms and say, how long, how long, O Lord, how long? Martin Luther King said, not long, not long. He believed that soon we'd get our act together and see that all of us really are created equal and that we can have the kind of society that would reflect the justice and the goodness and the love of God. How long? And the question for us is, for those of us who suffer disappointment, like, how long? How long until we share our bread? How long? until we repair the breach? How long until we restore the city? How long until we have a genuinely, emotionally healthy spirituality that is one with Jesus? After all, where was Jesus born? He was born in Bethlehem, and Bethlehem means the house of bread. When Jesus was born, where did Mary lay him in a manger? A manger is a feeding trough. Jesus came so that hungry people could be fed. 
Not good-looking ones, not successful ones, not just white American ones. All of God's children. And he wants all of God's children to be the kind of people that we can't bear the idea that somebody's out in the cold. We can't bear the idea that somebody's hungry. We can't bear any longer living lives that are just about me. God put us here to live for others, for a future generation. This is the fast that God desires. Let us pray. Glorious God, you have called us here. You have drawn us here with your great love to worship you. We gather in this hour with angels and archangels 